Good morning, everyone. Please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. While you're turning there, let me wish you a happy Resurrection Day. Happy Easter, everybody. Easter used to be a holiday celebrating the pagan goddess Ishtar. But who would agree the resurrection has trashed Ishtar's day? So now we say happy Easter, and we're not even talking about her. Thank God for the resurrection of Jesus. Why do we say happy resurrection day? Why is the resurrection good news? It's this question I hope to address this morning. And when you leave here, you'll have a fresh appreciation for the good news that the gospel is for us. But to appreciate the good news, first I've got to give you some bad news. It's not really news, it's old. It could be called old news, but it is the truth, and many people do not realize it. My first point today is we have a problem called sin. The sin problem, and everyone has done it. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 says, There is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Psalms 14 verse 2 and 3, and it says the same thing in 53 verse 2 and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Psalm 51, 5 says, David said this of himself, I was born in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He wasn't saying his parents were married, but he's saying he's born a sinner. Born a sinner to a mother and a father who were sinners. The New Testament is just as strong Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 and 8 says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Tell your neighbor, you have a sin problem. Everyone is a sinner. Have a picture here of a man who's become quite a celebrity in the last few years. His name is Frank Warren. In 2002, Frank Warren entered into an art exhibit in November of that year. He paid 60 bucks for a booth, and he put on display people's secrets. He had made up. 3,000 blank postcards, blank on one side and writing on the other, which explained his directions as well as his, his address to send it back to him. The directions said, please share your secret as artistically as you'd like to. I only have two requests. Number one, the secret must be something that is true, something you really did. And number two, it must be something that no one else knows, something you've never confessed to anyone before. Well, at first he didn't get all 3,000 cards back, but by the time the art show began, he had 85 postcards that he put up on display in his booth. It caused quite a stir. Well, today the mail continues to come. It's been over six years now. He gets over 100 postcards a day mailed to him, people confessing to him their secrets. He's now made up three different books. The guy's probably a millionaire. I don't know. Uh, he's been asked to lecture here and there. He's been interviewed. He has a website that gets like a million hits a week, I think. People confessing to him things they've really done that are secrets. And guess what, saints? Most of those secrets are sins. Wow. We're all sinners demonstrated in our culture, and I'm not sure if Frank is a Christian. Number two, we're all sinners, 
and we're all going to die. Sin has a curse with it. And everyone has that curse, the curse of death. Proverbs 14, 12, and it says the same thing in 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Ezekiel 18, 4, God says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. God told the first man and first woman if they ate of the forbidden fruit, the day they ate of it, they would die. And that happened. Not physically, but they died spiritually because that day they were separated from their maker. The communion, the fellowship they had with God came to an end. Sin always brings death to us. Chased to its furthest conclusion, dived into, to its deepest depths, a person will wind up dead. Addictions prove that every day. But it's more than physical death. It's a spiritual dynamic. Sin kills relationships. Sin brings an end to careers. Sin destroys prosperity. Sin tears families apart and splits up friends the soul that sins shall die you shall experience death this is the curse that being a sinner involves romans 5 12 says therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin thus death spread to all men because all sinned we're all sinners and we all experience death James 1, verse 14 and 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So you see the progression of evil here. First comes the desire, then comes the sin, then comes the death. The old King James Version says, We are tempted when we are drawn away by our lusts, and then lust conceives sin, and sin brings forth death. My daddy used to preach and still preaches that this is the original version of LSD. Lust brings sin, and sin brings death. So here's the bad news that makes the resurrection such good news. We are all sinners. Everybody is a sinner, and everybody is cursed with death. Physical, spiritual, marital, financial, and all in so many ways we experience death because of sin that is in the world. I think the death we're seeing in the markets, in Wall Street, there is a lot of sin that's behind that. It's created a hollowness in our economy. This is a heavy burden, isn't it? To be a sinner and to be cursed with death, a heavy burden. The good news is Jesus carried our sins. Isaiah 53, the messianic prophecy given by Isaiah, says, Surely, verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. (coughs) Excuse me. Verse 11 says, My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He was numbered with the transgressors, verse 12, and he bore the sin of many, the burden of sin. I purchased Frank Warren's book, his first book he came up with, with these postcard secrets that were sent to him, and tore out a lot of the pages and attached these secrets to bricks to symbolize the heaviness of sin. Would you like to hear some of them? Here's some people's secrets. One person says, I waste office supplies because I hate my boss. 
Another person says, there was no deer. I was just driving too fast. Another person says, I know I said I didn't, but I did. I am so sorry. I am a liar. Another person says, I just got my 60-day chip for sobriety at AA, yet I drink five nights a week. I'm fooling everyone but myself. I'm drunk right now. What a heavy burden to have to carry. Let's read Isaiah 53 again as translated in the New Living. Verse 5. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. My righteous servant, verse 11, will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. Verse 12, he bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Jesus Christ never sinned, yet he allowed himself to be sinned against, to be slandered, to be betrayed, to be denied, to be abandoned, to be falsely accused. He took on our identity as, as a sinner and received the accusation for such. This is identification, taking our place, being our substitute, paying our fine, receiving our penalty so that we could be freed from our case that sin has brought against us and be declared in innocent. He carried our sin. Let's look at some more of these postcard confessions. Here a person mailed to Frank Warren a parking ticket with these words written across it in white tape. I got a parking ticket and so did the car next to me. So I took my ticket and put it on the car next to me and it got paid by the person owning the car next to me. However, his ticket has not been paid because I have mailed it to you instead. Now that's kind of funny, but if you're the person on the cheating in the being cheated side, it's not funny at all. Sin always causes pain to everyone. Here a person confesses, I give decaf to customers who are rude. An employee of Starbucks. Some very private pain. Here a person confesses, I love one of my children can just kind of feel the pain in these artistic confessions. Here one person says, I'm the anonymous caller who told your boss that you've been stealing. <laughs> Heavy burdens of sin. Here a person confesses, when I cheat on you, I do it with someone who looks like you, is built like you, has the same hair as you, and the same eye color as you. Not because I prefer your build, but because if I get pregnant, I don't want you to be suspicious. Pain of sin. Isaiah 53 in the Message Bible. Verse 5 says, He took the punishment and made us whole. Through his bruises we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on Him. Verse 11, through what He experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones as He Himself carries the burden of their sins. He took on his own shoulders the sin of many. Verse 12. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. 
burden of sin. Here one person says, I should have known he had a wife, a child, a dog, and a white picket fence. Another person says, I became a policeman, hoping I could stop, and it's not working. Another person confesses, I steal Christian music. Another one confesses, I would give anything for an opportunity to be kind to my ex-wife. Another one confesses, I made a student repeat a grade just so I could flirt with his father for another year. The pain of sin is beyond imagination. Another person says, when I'm prepared to take a test, when I'm not prepared to take a test, I tell my teachers I was in a car accident. I've changed the dates on an old accident report 15 times in the last three years. The weight of sin. Another person says, I haven't spoken to my father in 10 years, and it kills me every day. What a burden sin places on our shoulders, causing us to live with secrets that no one knows that creates all sorts of side effects in our lives. See, sin brings death. It severs relationships. It separates us from God. But the good news of the gospel this morning is Jesus bore all of our sins. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Thank God. Hallelujah! Aren't you glad about it? Our sins were dumped upon him and he carried them for us. That's the good news of the gospel. That's why... Such a dark day as Friday is declared to be good Friday because he bore our sins. But he didn't stop there, saints. He arose from the dead for our justification. My fourth point is a sinner's justification is assured through the resurrection. Romans 4.24 says, It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised. Because of our justification. Romans 8, 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen. Our sin. Brought about the death of Jesus Christ. His resurrection brought about our justification. Do you see the contrast? Our condemnation brought about the necessity for Jesus to die for us. His resurrection brought about our justification. Condemnation brought his death. Resurrection brings us justification. We know our sins are gone. Because he is risen from the dead. Are you glad about it? Hallelujah. The sinner's hope is in the resurrection. Let me just share briefly the six E's of evidence for the resurrection story. The first E stands for the enemies of Jesus. They serve to prevent any hoaxes. They wanted to wipe out not only Jesus Christ himself personally, but also his influence and his followers to bring an end to his movement, to stop his disciples. So they made sure they knew he had predicted his death and his resurrection. They went to great pain so that no one could steal the body and fake a resurrection. Their very existence 
helps to set the framework for our faith to believe in the validity of the resurrection story. The second E stands for eyewitnesses. 17 eyewitness reports are recorded in five books of the Bible written by four different men. That would stand in any court of law today. The third E stands for the empty tomb. The early church was birthed just a short walk from the empty tomb. Talk about an evangelistic tool to take people down there and show it to them and to lead them to saving faith in Christ. The fourth E stands for the early believers who were tested by persecution and torture and yet not one recanted their faith in the story that they had witnessed. Charles Colson shares this story. He was part of the Nixon administration and actually did time in prison for his part in the Watergate scandal. He said when the heat was on during the days of the Watergate trials, there were people bailing out left and right simply for the sake of their reputations. He believes the resurrection story. He's a believer now because of what he walked through with the Watergate scandal that surely somebody would have cracked if this thing was a hoax, not just over the threat of losing their reputation, but losing their life, their livelihood, and their family and their well-being. The fifth E stands for the empire. The Roman Empire embraced the resurrection story after three centuries of trying to wipe it out. It was more than a matter of just if you can't beat them, let's join them. It stood in history as a legitimate fact. In fact, history has been permanently marked by the resurrection of Christ. We live during the year of 2009 A.D., Anno Domino, which stands for the time of our Lord, the time following his life on earth. The sixth E stands for enduring results the present day lives that are being changed can i see a show of hands if your life has been changed through the transformation that came when you believed in the resurrection of jesus hallelujah there's an opportunity here today for you to experience as well the enduring results of the resurrection of jesus christ Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love is demonstrated through what He did for us even when we were still sinners. And Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an incredible offer. We are all sinners. And God has demonstrated His love to us while we are sinners through His Son dying on the cross for us. And if we remain sinners, we're going to receive wages of death, eternal separation and death separated from God throughout eternity. But the gift of God, a gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 10, verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, period. Verse 10 goes into explaining how that can be true. He said, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I've declared to you the basic gospel today, the fact that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Without a Savior, we are doomed to die. And how Christ came to be our Savior and bore our sins on the cross and took our place and experience a death that was ours to taste. 
If you find yourself beginning to believe what I've been declaring today, a miracle is happening in your heart that we call saving faith. Saving faith, that is faith, that is the Christian faith, is not generated by ourselves or by great arguments or excellent apologetics. It's a miracle where God gives you the ability to believe something that is absolutely impossible to believe unless he gives you that ability. I believe in this room this morning are people that are beginning to believe the gospel like they've never believed it before. As a result of hearing the truth, the Lord is confirming it to your heart. And inside you is this, yes, this must be true. Verse 11 says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Doesn't matter what race you are. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He has done the work. His last three words on the cross before he died and gasped his last breath were these three words. It is finished. Everything that was needed to pay for your sins and mine, every burden he carried in his own body on the cross. And he completed the work. And our part is to put our faith in him and to call upon him and ask that his benefits become ours. Can we pray that today? that his benefits become ours. Oh God in heaven, I ask that the blood of Jesus, which was shed on the cross for the sins of the human race, would become my gift, that I would receive the benefits of that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We just pause for a minute here. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I'm pleading with you today. Don't let this day, this resurrection day, 2009, pass you by. Do not hear the gospel in vain without acting on it. Speaking forth what you're already believing in your heart. Verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 6, goes on to say, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Verse 3, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today's a day. Let's pray together. Oh God in heaven, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And I put my faith in him. Jesus, I call on your name. And I ask you to save me. To make me whole. I thank you for carrying my sins on the cross. My burden became yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Save me and make me clean. And forgive me in Jesus' name. you prayed that prayer, I would love to talk to you. Jesus Christ is drawing you into an intimate relationship with himself, which is more than just attending church and trying to live a good life. It is a kingdom of which you can become a citizen of. As you walk in his ways, he will give you power to do his will. You can accomplish things you would not imagine if you will but enter his kingdom with a submissive heart. You've heard the gospel today. I encourage you to not let this day pass you by, but to serve the Lord with all your heart. We want to meet you. We're going to close this service, and we pray that in the name of Jesus, that your life would be conformed to his image. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Walking to the moon. 